Good evening, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I got to see Avatar The Way of the Water in its theater premiere earlier this week. So I'd love to give you my impressions on the biggest film of the year. It's been 13 years since the last film, which is an insane time gap for any filmmaker. But honestly, it's become the norm for someone like James Cameron, one of the most respected action film directors of all time. He is responsible for classics such as Aliens, The Abyss, Terminator 1 and 2, and of course, the 11 Oscar winning Titanic. The first Avatar film still holds the biggest box office record of all time, amassing a preposterous sum somewhere around $2.9 billion. And for this sequel, it cost somewhere around $350 to $400 million to produce this film. Putting that aside, the expectations for this long-awaited sequel are sky high. For starters, it won't come as any surprise that the visuals in this film are simply spectacular. Everything about this film's visual fidelity has been worked to absolute perfection. And the incredible motion capture work has returned better than ever. You won't believe how good that looks. You'll completely forget that you're watching a film and be fully immersed in this alien world. Honestly, it blows me away just how much CGI has been packed into this film and none of it feels uncanny. As for the environment, the forests are just as lush and colorful as ever before. The action sequences this time around are more compelling and complex than ever before. And of course, the atrocities that the human bring to Pandora are horrific. The bright red fire is a strong contrast in comparison to the blue, green, and purple of the forest of Pandora. But by far the biggest highlight in the iteration of this installment of the Avatar franchise will be the water. Big surprise, right, considering the title? Anyway, you won't believe just how incredible the water scenes are. The work that has gone into shooting these underwater scenes simply blows my mind. Incredible work of ingenuity and creativity. It's steady the art and the kind of thing that deserves to have people running to the cinema to see it on the biggest IMAX screen possible. There is nothing like it. Indeed, world building is clearly the strongest part of Avatar The Way of Water. I always appreciate the environmental messages at the core of both films. The first film was all about protecting our forest, but now with the expansion into Pandora's tropical islands, the theme is all about protecting our oceans. I also thought it was interesting how not all Navi are alike. These seafaring Navi, for example, have much larger tails, and their arms are almost like fins. However, my biggest concern Avatar has never been about the world building. I think everyone's going into this film expecting a visual splendor, and you will get that. My concern has always been in the writing. The last film was a visual marvel, but was absolutely tone deaf when it came to dialogue. Going into this film, I was really hoping that those 13 years would have given Mr. Cameron time to work out this weakness, and clearly he seems to be aware of it. It's not a surprise to him that we feel that way. On top of that, you have to layer in a little bit of that, you know, pesky plotting and character uh, development and all that story? stuff. Story? Yeah, oh, whatever. However, I regret to inform you that the film suffers in exactly the same areas as the last film. Honestly, in my opinion, I think the writing was mediocre. Cameron's tin ear for dialogue applies to every facet of this film, though perhaps the worst eye-rolling offenders are the Sky People. The military chatter is so American, and I mean that in the worst way possible. I cringed in the first film when Jake Sully said Ura in a completely flat and sleep-inducing tone, and it blows my mind that they repeat the same exact mistake Again, with another Marine saying it this time. I mean, guys, a little bit of oomph in your performance? It's so flat and dull. My god. Building on that idea, I feel that the Marine Squad's personality that are applied to their Navi avatars are so stereotypical it hurts. We got ourselves a stoic Navi in sunglasses, I think, and they're covered in tattoos. And they're the worst kind of cheap tattoos that are so stereotypical that you'd find on a drunk biker next to a pool table in some bar. And you got other guys lifting weights and blowing bubble gum out of their mouth. Yes, a giant Navi alien blowing bubble gum. All of this while they're high-fiving each other after burning down a forest and doing who knows what atrocity. So yeah, it's shockingly cookie cutter. I'll spare you further details, I think you get the point by now. Frankly, I can understand that they want to use a simple language to reach out to as much of a universal audience as possible as the last film did, but shit. It's no secret that this was by far the weakest aspect of the last film, so it's disappointing to say the least that after all this time, there was virtually no creative growth in this aspect of filmmaking. There is no doubt in my mind that Cameron is a visionary genius when it comes to R&D, visual effects, and action sequences. But when it comes to writing, last few films, 
he has improved himself to be very worthy of that role. Honestly, he's starting to evolve into the George Lucas of dialogue in my eyes. It's even more baffling when you consider that there were two other writers to help on the screenplay. 13 years, 3 plus hours of film, and barely any dialogue worth pondering about. This unfortunate results in not one actor being able to shine through in this film with their performances. Even Kate Winslet, one of the great actresses of our time, is submerged by this script. Honestly, if I didn't know that she was cast in this film and who she was cast as, I would have never connected the dots. It has little to do with the motion capture that covers the, the actual human actor with this alien Navi look. It really has all to do with their stoic and wooden personalities and the way they're directed. Yes, they have very expressive animations and their whole ritual lifestyle around this godlike entity is fascinating to behold. And indeed, the devastation on their souls when they see their homeland getting burned to ashes is honestly heartbreaking. But when it comes to every other interaction with every other character in the film, it is so dull. That being said, one of the most interesting performances in the film is, once again, Stephen Lang. I won't spoil the details, but yes, he's back from the grave. The script has a very convenient loophole around his death, and I will give him credit, it works pretty well. In my opinion, he brings the most passion, drive, and drama in this film, and is an important catalyst to my interest for the future films. And on the other hand, the weakest performance once again goes to Sam Worthington as Jake Sully. I never thought he was a great actor, and throughout all these years, he hasn't exactly improved himself. Frankly, his performance was as bland as dry rice. Which leads me to my next point. I feel that there are a bunch of illogical narrative arcs in this film. Sully is supposed to be a hero and a genius war leader, apparently. But after an attack on his family, he flees the jungle so he can protect the Navi from the forest and his family as well. This never made a lot of sense to me. Whether he flees the forest or not, the Navi will be at war with the sky people anyway. And here in the forest, at least he had home advantage in the sense that he has a bond with the, the Navi there and he knows the lay of the land very well. Not only the fact that he also was a marine with the sky people, so he has a perfect idea of what their capabilities are. But no, they escape in the exile and they risk jeopardizing the life of those seafaring Navi, which in the end is exactly what happens. Big surprise, right? Honestly, you should have seen this coming a mile away, him being a military tactical genius apparently. Ultimately, it feels like it's going against everything we learned about him in the previous film. He was Turk Maktal, the guy who was there to protect the people from the sky people, not to abandon them and then risk the life of other people. And speaking of other inconsistencies, I really like the idea at the beginning of the film with these marines taking their Navi avatar. This way they have this advantage on both sides. They have the power of the physical bodies of the Navi and their tactical training as marines. But honestly, it doesn't feel like that holds any bearing in this film whatsoever. They still feel like cannon fodder later in the film anyway. So that was a missed opportunity. Another major point of criticism in this film is that it's incredibly predictable and formulaic. This sequel, when I think about it, is completely parallel to the narrative arc of the previous film. If you extract it from a macro point of view, it's literally beat for beat the same thematics. We're reintroduced to the world of Pandora, we're reintroduced to the sky people and their mission here on Pandora. Jake Sully and his family are adapting to the water Navi, whereas before he was adapting to just the Navi in general. And then of course, there's a climactic fight at the end. And one final detail of similarities, the sky people in the previous film came for Unobtainium, now they're here for Amrita. Basically same function, different form. So when I think about it, we waited 13 years and went through a three hour film to retread the exact same character growth as in the previous film? Really? Beyond that, there are little to no surprise to be found. Obviously, I won't spoil anything, but I would be shocked if anything comes at a, as a complete surprise to viewers. There are little hints early in the film that will be echoed later, and the foreshadowing is pretty blunt on the nose. Even the tragic scene in this film is using the same exact soundtrack as when the World Tree, whatever that thing was called in the previous film, was being burned down. Though to the film's credit, the event that happens in this film is quite tragic and the music works perfectly to complement the scene. I will say the one real novelty in The Way of the Water is this chosen one character that has been created. And yes, as you may have heard, Sigourney Weaver is back and is playing that character. And even though her character is dead from the previous film, she is back to this miracle childbirth situation. Yes, the script has a few moments like that where they conveniently bring a character back from the dead, but I really won't complain too much because this gives us some of the best characters in the film, and there's so few of them. 
Anyway, it is kind of weird when you think about it because she plays a 14-year-old girl even though Sigourney Weaver is a woman of 73 years old who is voicing her. But it actually works a lot better than you may think, by some miracle. It's an interesting concept for this character and I am curious to see it unfold, which is kind of one of my biggest issues as well because once again we've waited so long and this is a seed that will only bloom in the next films. Once again, 13 years, 3 plus hours of film, only to be blue balled with the most interesting questions that will only be answered in future films that are set to come out at least in 2024? Really? Finally, do I feel like the 3D glasses added anything? Honestly, not really. I wonder if we actually removed that 3D element, would it actually ruin the experience? Personally, I think not. It's not like it was back in 2009 when it was a completely new thing, and to its credit, it really did use it to its maximum potential. Here, it feels a bit gimmicky. I'm curious if other people feel the same, but personally, the IMAX adds a lot to the experience, but the 3D glasses, not so much. Obviously, I have my issues with this film, but it's not like I want it to fail. I am curious for the future of the franchise. There's some interesting questions that I feel have potential to become something fantastic. It's great to see this massive giant blockbuster film to have a really important environmental message integrated into its core of its film. And I certainly recommend you see it on the biggest IMAX screen possible because it is simply sublime in its visual splendor. The final hour of the film alone is just an incredible action film. It really feels like a best of compilation of some of James Cameron's greatest cinematic achievements. As well worth mentioning, there's some very clever inventions in the film. For example, that crab-like exoskeleton that we see later on in the film. And arguably, the most memorable parts of the film are when it comes to the alien animal life that we discover in this film. Most notably, perhaps, the whales in this one. Honestly, this really feels like a David Attenborough sci-fi epic adventure, and I do mean that in the best way possible. So yeah, the highs of this film are sky high. So it's dreadfully disappointing to see just how weak the narrative execution is. Because there is potential for something brilliant here. Unfortunately, the script is a massive weight that sinks the Titanic to the bottom of the ocean. I'm going to give Avatar The Way of the Water a 6 out of 10. It's perfectly possible you guys will enjoy it a lot more than I did, and that's fine. There's quite a lot to enjoy here, but I do have my issues with it, and this is my own genuine opinion. So take it or leave it. And that is all for today. As always, wishing you and your family nothing but the best. Take care and talk to you soon.